Um, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us on this uh, beautiful Friday afternoon for a book reading with uh, Dr. Lawrence Taylor. Uh, my name is Jeff Bannister and I'm the director of the Southwest Center. Um, this event is a collaborative effort between the Southwest Center and the Center for Latin American Studies, uh, both of which are units in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences here at the University of Arizona. So Dr. Taylor is going to be reading to uh, us with a, uh, from a selection of his latest book, uh, Tales from the Desert Borderland. Uh, and then that will be followed up by some uh, quick comments um, from my colleague in the center, uh, cultural anthropologist Tom Sheridan, and from Dr. Natalia Mendoza Rockwell, who is also an anthropologist and a scholar of the US-Mexico borderlands. And uh, Natalia is based uh, at Fordham University. So we'll have, um, so we'll have some uh, the reading and some commentary, and then we'll, uh, we're going to try to leave as much time as possible for uh, some question and answer. Um, and there are a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, you can send us questions through the chat box um, and, and uh, uh, we'll definitely do our best to field those. Or uh, you can actually just unmute your mic um, and ask uh, your question directly to us. And, uh, and again, we'll do our best to make sure that everybody has a chance to, um, to, uh, to ask a question. So we have a little bit of a tight schedule and so we can, do, uh, to make sure that we can actually leave a little time for questions. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to my uh, colleague, Tom Sheridan, who's gonna introduce Dr. Taylor to all of us. Thanks, all Tom. right, thank you, Jeff. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lawrence Taylor. Before I get into that though, I wanna warn you that I've just spent two and a half hours in the dentist chair so if I slur or drool, it's Novocaine, not Bacchanoran. I've known Larry Taylor and his colleague and partner, Mav Hickey, for probably two decades now. And you know you're old when you start measuring things in decades rather than years. But uh, when I first met Larry, he was teaching at Lafayette College and then he moved to Maynooth University, just west of Dublin, where he was the first anthropologist in the Republic of Ireland. And he taught there until he became uh, vice president for international affairs, a position in which he fostered a, a very robust exchange program between Maynooth University and the University of Arizona. Larry has spent his career, his early career, he focused on Ireland and wrote two ethnographies, Dutchman on the Bay and Occasions of Faith, an anthropology of Irish Catholics. But then he turned his attention to the US-Mexico borderlands where with Maeve, he published three books, The Road to Mexico, Tunnel Kids, and Ambos Nogales, Intimate Portrait of the US-Mexico Border. And these books were written for a, primarily for a popular audience. And so Tales from uh, the Desert Borderland is really a continuation of that kind of uh, ethnographic sensibility that Larry brings to this work. And uh, it's even though it's fictionalized, it's a way that he's able to really write about the nuances and the quirkiness of the desert borderlands. And uh, it's a wonderful read. One of the things that it has impressed me, one of the concepts that it, it has impressed me in Larry's work is his concept of moral entrepreneurs. And I hope that we're able to get into that uh, when we, we have an exchange later after Larry has finished his reading. But anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lawrence Taylor. It's great. Well, thanks. Uh, first of all, before I say anything, I wanted to thank uh, Jeffrey and Tom and everybody else involved and Natalia for coming on uh, as well and for the Southwest Center and the, um, <clears throat> the Center for Latin American Studies 
uh, for their backing of this and for launching it. I have to say, thinking of the Southwest Center, when I first began working in this part of the world, things were far more informal. And uh, when Maeve and I arrived and I had the idea, we had the idea of the book, The Road to Mexico, I remember going into the Southwest Center and uh, showing a proposal to, uh, <clears throat> to Joe Wilder, who had his boots up on the table and looked at it right there while I was sitting there and said, yeah, I'll give you some money and I'll lend you my brother's truck because there's no way you're going to do this work with a with a uh, Toyota that you're driving now. So that was <laughs> that was <laughs> the good old days of uh, working on the border. Anyway, um, this book is uh, fiction. Uh, that's my defense against anything that anybody says about it. Uh, and it's eight linked short stories. And what I mean by linked is that a minor character in one story can appear as a different kind of character or a more major character in the next with the idea of bringing you uh, the reader along the border and the stories move from west to east. The first takes place in the uh, uh, villages just outside of San Diego and then it moves to uh, the Yaucumba in the desert and then uh, Yuma and eventually to Nogales and ends appropriately for me in the tunnel uh, in, in Nogales. So what I'm going to do is read a condensed version of two stories, uh, each of them condensed, uh, to give you a sense, I think, of the variation, not only in place, uh, kind of where these stories are set, but also in the, in the tone of the stories. Because one of the things that I found about the border in my years of working here and representing it is while understanding how fraught things are politically and personally, the humor that one encounters all the time was, was very often missing. So I wanted to recapture some sense of that as, as well. So <clears throat> the two stories, are, the first that I'll read from is Love and Lettuce, uh, which takes place in Yuma and concerns the central character, Concha, a recent uh, undocumented uh, migrant to that town. And the second is set mainly on uh, the Tohono O'odham Reservation and involves another character who I'll introduce at that time. So, love and lettuce. Mira, Chica, here she comes, Concha whispers. She and Rita scrunch down in the wide front seat of Rita's Dodge Ram, draining their thirst busters through purple straws and peering over the dashboard. The golden stretch caddy floats like a yacht down First Avenue past colorful, if modest, bungalows and eases into its gravel berth besides, beside White's wedding chapel, a rambling Edwardian that anywhere else would be a funeral home, but here in resourceful Yuma provides the perfect setting for the young woman avoiding both church and Las Vegas. The guests find their seats in the rows of folding chairs and the groom, his vigilant mother and aunt, upright and alert in the first row, takes his place in the flowered pergola, trying not to fidget with the rosette in his lapel. The father of the bride, a slim and bow-legged vaquero in his best soft yellow ostrich boots, emerges from the limo, settles his Stetson against the breeze, and reaches back into the car. Bracing his boot heel on the curb, he holds his breath and, as if to lever a reluctant calf from a bovine womb, gives a vigorous yank. Out into the sunlight pops the mother of the bride, swathed in pink lace, wobbling on her heels as she adjusts ample rows of flesh straining against the fabric. He reaches back into the limo to gently deliver their daughter, a fairy queen floating out on a cloud of cream sut. Concha and Rita watch intently from the truck as the bride deftly gathers up her satin and prepares to sail down the grassy aisle to claim her prize. Que bonita, Rita whispers, forgetting herself. Puta, bitch. Oh, lo siento. Sorry, not her. The dress. <laughs> Just you wait, says Concha. Esa maldita bruja is going to look damn silly in that dress. She pulls a cell from, from her bag and begins to punch furiously at the buttons. Concha and Rita had met the year before at the Raspado stand on Yuma's 8th Street, La Ocho. 
Concha had crossed a few months earlier with her little boy and found a place with Lourdes, proprietress of the Totearia bearing her name, who, taken with little Josecito's fondness for her cochinitos, little pastry pigs, and the rough charm of his mother, offered a room back behind the shop over the garage. And the deal turned out to include a job up the road at Matilde's or Espado's stand, where Concha happily pictured herself leaning over the counter, handing a big mango cone to Josecito's future father, flirting with one eye and keeping the other on her laundry across the street. For the local laundromat consisted of a long bank of outdoor washers and dryers chained to a concrete wall built into the hillside. But the money was barely enough to live on, and as for flirting, the stand turned out to be no fountain of romance. Her customers were mostly other young mothers already dragging two or three little ones they were trying to shut up with syrupy ice. And there was Concha behind the counter sporting L'Oreal ripe tomato on her hungry lips, wasted. That is until the day she decided to change the recipe, not of the lipstick, of the raspados. Matilde had gone for the weekend and left Concha in charge. She shaved the ice real fine and instead of syrup, bought a big sack of mangoes off a truck by the border. Cheap because they were one day too ripe to eat and perfect for raspados. She told her customers that if they wanted the real thing, then the flavor of the day was mango. And soon the stand was surrounded by very ha happy patrons. Concha was thinking that if she owned the stand, she could make a fortune with it. Maybe even bring in a whole better class of clientes, like even a father for Josecito. She pictured a chain of pretty little stands, Conchanitas Raspados, brightening the lives of Chicana America. But she would never make enough money working for Matilda to get even one place of her own. That's when she met Rita, who alone among the happy customers that day appreciated her lipstick. They were like lost sisters from the beginning, cuates of the kind that complement rather than repeat one another. Rita was as slim and pointed as her sparse conversation with three years on this side of La Ligna among dusty heads of lettuce, iceberg, romaine, green leaf, red, Boston, buttercup. Concha, the new arrival, was as round and firm as a melon grande. She was looking for a boyfriend. Rita was looking to get rid of hers. Seduced by her first spoonful of finely shaved ice soaked with real mango, Rita listened as Concha confessed that she was dying in that raspado stand, socially and financially, and she nagged her foreman until they agreed to take Concha on at the lettuce. I'm glad you're working with me because, but I miss that raspado you gave me, Rita said. <laughs> I gave you that because you scared me with that Taliban headdress, Concha answered. But like the other women, Concha grew to love the picker's headgear, keeping it on after work, riding back into town, 50 wrapped heads, many topped by baseball caps and a white school bus trailing a pair of porta potties. They looked like a South, Saudi Arabian women's softball team on a tour. They fan out into the shops in small groups of arm linked friends, Concha drifting through the aisles of Food City like the newest wife of, of an oil shake, her great black mascara eyes brilliant above the mask, pulling sacks of dried pinto beans from the shelves. Life was suave on La Ocho. Evenings, she would pop Josecito into his stroller and set out to sample tacos, dorados, cocktails de elote, camarones, y tostadas at every sun faded plywood or rolling tin shack. Gorgia supplemented her income with Sundays behind the counter in her landlady's shop, which is where one Sunday afternoon in March, she met Pete Velez. He had been sent in for after mass Sunday morning pastry by his mother who waited with her sister in the car. The two filled the spacious back seat of the Pontiac. Tia Rosa, fat, powdered, and content, as happy as any five-year-old in the expectation of sweets. Mama Pilar, edgy, her little cantinflas mustaches twitching, head swiveling on the three layers of mole-strewn neck, awake to any approaching opportunity or enemy. Concha took no notice of Pete until she looked up and met his lazily gluttonous eyes, considering her along with the pastries. Having noted his creased jeans, carefully ironed green rugby shirt and puffy, unworried face, she then looked past him through the screen door at the glinting black sheen of the Pontiac, out of whose window Mama Pilar glowered. Try the capriatada, she said, carving off a sample slice of the pudding cake. It's the one reason I look forward to la cuaresma, Lent, because it doesn't help me be holy, me entiendes, 
because like it tastes so good and doesn't put me in the mood to give up anything. The tip of her tongue passed quickly over her upper lip, leaving a glistening trail for him to follow. Vélez glowed, letting the capriotada slosh around his mouth and then ordered a dozen empanadas, which Concha set daintily in a box. For the ride home, she smiled, sliding three pochinitos into a small bag over the counter. It's not a long ride. <clears throat> he laughed, his soft face coming alive for a moment. Bueno, she said, if you don't live far away, maybe you'll come back soon. I'm working here Sundays and I live right behind. In only three Sundays, she succeeded in making him think they were an item, though they hadn't been farther than the shop together. But then he, or rather his mother, Pilar, stopped coming after mass. But one Friday evening, Concha found him there when she went to pick up Josecito, his bland face boyish with naughty excitement as her toddler, whom he had hoisted up on his shoulders, pounded merrily on the crown of his head. She invited him to walk, and so they did, along the edge of the darkening fields, returning to her room and his fumbling but sincere lovemaking. And that became their custom through that sweltering summer to meet on Fridays, stroll and dine on breaded shrimp tacos under the stars at Chito's Mariscos, and to grope for zippers and clasps in Concha's darkened room while Josecito slept and the swamp cooler roared. Concha began counting the days till his graduation. Not that he had promised anything. They had, however, spoken at length of plans, his to open a little accounting office downtown, and hers, far more elaborate, for a raspado empire stretching from California to Texas with a home office in Yuma, Arizona. But he never mentioned his mother, much less offered to bring Concha around to meet her. With summer over, college was absorbing most of Pete's attention and not just the insoluble posers in his accounting textbook. Though she never gave him more than a glance, aloof and alluring Diana Tejera never failed to pick a seat alongside him. Then one day she reached across his desk, <clears throat> letting her gold charm bracelet pass softly over the long hairs on his forearm. Her long cinnamon spice nail pointed to one of a series of equations. Do we take this one for the problem, she whispered, and put the numbers on the board in for the X and the Y? Pete had been sitting in a flummox stupor. In the dimly lit caverns of his mind, he had already forsaken accounting for his new all-terrain vehicle and was bouncing and sailing over the imperial sand dunes when he felt the heat from her breast near his elbow. Uh, right, he said, bringing himself around quickly, her perfume reaching his nose like a jolt of ammoniated spirits. Yeah, that's how you do it, he added, nodding, nodding knowingly. Oh, thanks, she answered, a little girl's smile warming a face shaped into as faithful a copy of Jennifer Lopez at the Academy Awards as her allowance could cover. Diana Tierra was only 19. She had grown up and still lived in a house <clears throat> very like Pete's on the south side. It was the kind of place where neighbors met while watering the lawns on palm trees or palm trees, remarking on trash cans left too long on the curb. And if any housewife paused to sit outside, she did so out back on lawn furniture. Nobody dragged her kitchen chair out the front door like on La Ocho. Diana had spent the last five years while Pete was effortlessly washing out of one half-hearted endeavor after another, getting through school and watching the older neighborhood boys, high school heroes, every one of them, hit the real world like a brick wall. The few who didn't crash and burn had a plan, and so would she. Deanna headed for the local community college, giving herself two years to gather a few tradable skills and a husband, which is how she found herself in accounting and sitting alongside Vélez. He was just what she was looking for, seven years older, no Ricky Martin, but nice looking enough, vulnerable, adrift, but not defeated, moldable. She knew him to be the child of the striving Pilar Vélez, a frequent window shopper in her parents' real estate office. He was shy, but her opening was clear. He would make it through the course only with her help. As for handling the ever vigilant Senora Vélez, that was easy. Diana waited a couple of Saturdays until the old woman turned up at her mother's office, feigning an interest in the new development of patio homes. Diana offered to show her brochures, taking the opportunity to mention how lucky she was to have met Pete 
to have so bright and nice a man as her son helping her with the class. Pilar gave her a piercing appraisal, beady black eyes burning in a tower of folded flesh like an obese featherless eagle. Yes, he has helped me enough that I'm doing well now. Of course, we have only chatted a little about other things, but he's always bragging about your tamales. She laughed disarmingly and the old lady smiled despite herself, two of her three neck rolls relaxing their taut grip on her head. Diana continued, my mother tried to teach me to make them when I was a little girl, but I was too young and foolish to listen. And now she's too fed up with me to try again. She touched the old lady's arm for a second, causing her heavy flesh to quiver. Before she could stop herself, Pilar had invited her to come over that very evening. Diana had no trouble appearing to be a quick learner. She had been deftly stuffing and wrapping tamales since she was five and was happy to give all the credit to her newfound teachers. And so pressed against their young protege around the steaming kettle jammed with layers of their perfect corn husk wrap twisted and tied tamales, the sisters came as close to a joyful camaraderie as they ever had. Meanwhile, Pete looked up at the scene and felt, not for the first time, that he was playing only a minor role in the story of his own life. Mama Pilar, who had been suffering in silence through that summer, had of course known all about Concha and nearly gagged on the powerful scent of wet and wild every Saturday morning as she stuffed her son's clothing angrily into the washer. It was with elation and the heady sweet taste of imminent revenge that she noticed the change one Saturday, the sly smiles and touches when once again Diana came by for tamale making. Why not come to mass with us tomorrow, dear? She offered over, over at St. Anthony's. Pilar smiled all the way through the appallingly dull service in happy anticipation. And then when everyone was comfortably, comfortably arranged in the Pontiac, she asked Pete to drive to Lourdes for pastries. Diana, darling, why don't you go in with Pete and pick out whatever you like? She sent her out like a smart bomb and settled back to await the blast. In the weeks that followed, Concha took out her anger mainly on the lettuce, whacking unmercifully stalk after stalk, the human aspect of iceberg assisting the fantasy. At the end of the row, her basket overflowed with the massacred heads of Pete Vedes. Rita was still by her side, executing her own lost loves. They took turns shouting out the names of their victims until they collapsed laughing, loud enough that the foreman turned to scowl, sure they were discussing himself. The wedding announcement came as no surprise, but that didn't make it any easier. She didn't really miss Pete, but couldn't tear her eyes away from the photo of Diana in the local paper, from her look of sweet victory. Puta, I thought you had put him behind you, girl, Rita said, <clears throat> wary of the fury in her friend's eyes, but more so by the serene smile that suddenly stole like a possessing spirit across her face. And so on the appointed day, the girls are stationed in Rita's truck across from the wedding chapel. Rita watches in stunned admiration as Concha punches the numbers on her cell phone. Her first call is to the local police to whom she introduces herself as the estranged but not yet divorced spouse of one Peter Velez who is about to marry again. And as she repeats in more detail in her second call to the Migra to an illegal bitch whose entire family has snuck across the border to take part. You better get here fast, she advises both branches of local law enforcement. Soon blue and green uniforms are swarming through the reeling wedding party. Poor Senora Velez looks on in confused horror as her son seeks in vain to convince a policeman that he needs no proof of divorce since he has never been married. While a few yards away, agents have corralled the tejeras who fumble through pockets and purses for evidence of citizenship. The sun begins to set, bathing California, Arizona, and Mexico in a perfect pink haze. And the guests who have wandered about like movie extras waiting for direction, finally disperse. The bride, too stunned to cry, a macabre effigy of herself, grasping the gathered skirts of a gown, stands alone on the lawn, but for the little ring bearer, Anthony, who busies himself unraveling 
the fine lace at the end of her bridal trail. And that's the uh, love and lettuce. So we'll uh, continue with a very different story, as I said, involving uh, Chico, <clears throat> who is the um, son of a uh, Atom father who he barely knew as a child and an Irish uh, mother whose father was a miner in the area around Ajo. And the story starts with him receiving a letter from his estranged mother who he hasn't seen in years. Chico pulled up to the Indian cafe and found a corner seat across from a community bulletin board blanketed with curling printouts. Apostolic camp meeting coming up soon, AA meeting at Santa Rosa, rodeo queen pageant, but most were notices of death. And among them, the delicate figure of a woman with a small white face capped by a bowl of gray blonde hair, Sheila Cassidy. For one long strange moment, Chico stared into the shadowy printer dot eyes. Her wake, he read, was consigned to the assembly of God. He took the letter out of his pocket as if by reading the words of his living mother, her death might be rendered less abrupt, slowed into a space he could still enter. There were few words, and while Sheila was always given to elliptical remarks, they usually contained some reference to Jesus or the Holy Ghost. The letter, however, spoke of other deities. Son, the ocean has cursed me. You must come and help me. Come right away. The ocean is killing me. Chico found no wake. Only Consuela in her barren living room conferring with a very large man in horn rimmed glasses. I am Pastor Williams. Your mother is in mortal danger. Chico stared dumbly. Danger? Her soul. The pastor's round and deep brown face covered in a perfect sheen of perspiration hung immobile inches from Chico's. Your father's sisters took your mother away from the tender care of us in the assembly of God. The Catholics came and took her to Tapawa, Consuela put it more simply. He imagined the scene, his father's ardent Catholic sisters hijacking Sheila's living feverish pain racked body. God knows they cared little enough for his poor mother while she was alive, so they must have been trying to capture her in time to preside over her death and then bury her alongside the husband she had not seen for decades among the Catholics. The poor woman was besieged by the devil, Pastor Williams howled while the other, <clears throat> all the while gripping Chico's forearm in his enormous fist. She was raving when she was ill, saying crazy things about the ocean. And I had been preparing a cleansing prayer vigil only to find your aunts had taken her away. Now she has died in that awful tormented state and those women have surely surrounded her with Roman confusion and perdition, idolatry. You must go, Chico, and get your mother back here, back home with us. He let his paw fall heavily on Chico's so shoulder, gripping him like some fathers do their young sons, as if to inspire both affection and fear, nearly propelling him out the door on his Christian mission. But once outside, Chico's gaze fell on the sorry gravestones around the church, bathed in the merciless noon light. The unfocused regret he had been feeling about Sheila <clears throat> about being it being too late to find anything he had lost, slid beneath the simple, powerful determination to keep her out of this sad place. So with that sense of limited but more appealing mission, he drove south. His Aunt Juana led him into the living room, now transformed into a mini chapel. He passed down the aisle between two phalanxes of seated women the town's leading Catholics, the one who ran the show as weak-willed outsider priests came and went. Father Gilmartin, the incumbent, was there smiling meekly and nodding to Chico, while beside him Chico's other aunt, Carmen, stood glowering with barely contained hostility. Quaffed heads pivoted to watch, approving but cautious, as Chico made his hesitant way toward his mother's open coffin. Sheila looked disgusted concerningly alive and unexpectedly Irish, 
rather like a mother pretending to sleep so that her children will leave her in peace. But she was surrounded by the very perdition that assembly pastor Williams feared, a chaos of candles and glasses adorned with polygram etchings of Nuestro Señor, a table crowded with holy pictures and statues draped with colored ribbons, a lurid new Our Lady of Guadalupe, a careworn Santo Nino de Atocha missing much of his nose, and of course, San Francisco Javier, that stern black bearded and robed 16th century Basque Jesuit recumbent in his glass coffin. Feeling no more comforted by Roman theatrics than assembly hysterics, Chico found a seat near the back door as if unrelated to the deceased and let the odors of damp concrete and perfume wax induce a beery open-eyed sickly sleep but he was startled to feel a hand softly laid on top of his own. He turned to see the pretty teen, a pretty teen smiling at him with unlikely green eyes. Hi, I'm your cousin, Angelina. Juan is my gram. You're Chico, right? The old ladies were all whispering your name when you came in. <laughs> kind of fucked up, huh? Sorry about your mom. Chico's answer was interrupted by the crashing thud of the door, thrown open hard enough to bounce off the wall, nearly knocking him from his seat. The roused congregation turned as one to see Pastor Williams, large and furious as a Samoan wrestler. On either side of the intruder was a hefty assembly woman retainer, a daunting war party. The pastor, now commanding the room, took one dramatic stride inward and whipped off his glasses as if, as if he were unleashing the malignant superpower of his eyes. One focused like a laser on the coffin, the other, apparently only intermittently under his control, screamed wildly about the room, alighting for a second here and there on startled Catholic faces. Your graven images will bring seven plagues down on your sinning heads. The pastor's colossal head swiveled slowly from side to side, taking in the now uniformly stunned audience, open-mouthed and riveted to their tecate seats. He paused to savor his mastery of the moment and then suddenly raised his arm up in a wide arc, gesturing imperiously toward the front of the room as if to make the clutch of Catholic ladies sitting or standing between him and poor Sheila part like the Red Sea his booming voice now indisputably prophetic, filling the room. Our sister, come away out of that demonic horror. Taking their cue, the two assembly women hurled themselves headlong up the aisle, flowing like liquid, liquid vengeance toward the coffin, sending a few slow, <clears throat> slow moving frightened Catholics spinning out of their path. Father Gilmartin affected the quivering retreat of a wounded rabbit, and the entire congregation froze in stunned silence. But Juana and Carmen, who alone had risen to their steady feet at the pastor's entrance, watching and waiting, unfazed through his performance, moved to defend their sister-in-law in death as they never would have in life, stepping out in front of the coffin to form a massive self-righteous wall of flesh between the deceased and the intruders. The assembly ladies were unprepared for resistance and ground to a noisy halt before the sisters. After a moment of shrill, damning gospel citations, they could do nothing <clears throat> but slowly withdraw. Pastor Williams was left alone to face Juan and Carmen, who deadpanned in the ancient autumn way a 10,000 year old stare right through their now unhinged enemy. He continued to spout assurances of divine retribution, but with decreasing confidence all the time retreating and finally, as smoothly as it's possible for a man of that size, backing out the door. The words justice in a mortal soul hung in the air behind him, but the sisters were left in undisputed ownership of poor Sheila. Father Gilmartin emerged from hiding to occupy, however tentatively, the clerical space, and Juana and Carmen returned to their seats with unseemly smirks of victory, Juana throbbing a fat finger on the edge of the coffin on her way. Chico and Angelina sought the open air, finding a few empty chairs just outside the door.
<laughs> That's one for the Catholics. Angelina couldn't help but laugh. <clears throat> Under the direction of his father, father's brother, Wiley Nestor, Sheila's body is stolen from Juan, Juan and Carmen, and part of the story you won't hear, and taken across the border to be buried in the old way in Pozo Verde, but not before Chico and Angela take the body with them on the pilgrimage to Magdalena and then return it to Pozo Verde. <clears throat> Following Nestor's direction, Chico buried Sheila in a sharp crevice in the hillside, marking her grave like the others with a heap of stones. Four things, always four. You took her to Marena, that was good. And you buried her here, also good. Now two more things, one journey. Your mother's letter said it. About the ocean? Yeah, Itoi's cave looks over the ocean, way out in Pinicate by the sea. That cave is sacred to your aunt Viola's people, the Hiatjed Autumn, who took your mother into their bosom. Time and time on, those people went to the sea to get salt, but they couldn't just take the salt and go back up to the land. The ocean was giving them something of great value and the ocean was powerful and dangerous. You don't mess with the ocean. You take away the salt, you leave something behind, something valuable. So they would always thank the ocean and then throw something real important like a necklace of fine stones say, into the waves. Now, your mother wasn't going on no salt pilgrimage, but maybe she was down there in Rocky Point one time and left without giving, and so the ocean came after her. Maybe because she left the Hiatjed Way, all the gods were after her with all that assembly shit she was doing. You got to go to the ocean, follow Hiatjed path through the Pinacate to it Itoi's cave, then through the dunes to the sea. Nestor continued, now looking at Angelina. You go with Chico to the cave, help him. Angelina reached over and touched Chico's arm, little and big sister. Then to Chico, leave the stone from your mother's grave with Itoi, then go to the ocean. You ask a pardon for your mother and throw her necklace into the waves. That's one thing you gotta do for sure. And San Francisco is gonna go with you now. Somehow Chico had no difficulty with the notion that he needed to throw a silver plated chain of coral the tiny cross into the sea, or that a Jesuit saint would help him in this mission to placate the Atam spirits angry with his Irish mother. And so before dawn the next day, they drove 100 miles west across the desert to the edge of the Pinacate, a great volcanic wilderness through which they had to walk up the increasingly rugged basalt black hills, the greater heights seeming only to bring them closer to the punishing sun. The climb to Itoi's cave is not difficult, and renewed with the water, they arrive just as the shadows disappear and the rocks gray into one another. In the dark, the heat of the desert vanishes upward, as if the gods have opened the sky like a lid. Chico unfurls the sleeping bags side by side, looking up into the brilliant bands of stars. From there, high as they are, there are no earthly lights to be seen. They have said very little to one another all day, so Angelina's voice, low and soft though it is, startles Chico. Do you think this will work? I mean, will this help your mother? Will it help you? I don't know if it, anything works or if anything much can help me or my mother. Sometimes I think the last time anything made sense to me was way back in my Crips and Bloods days. I knew who I was then, we all did. You could feel it every time you tied on your colors, when you walked with your boys. Sometimes you could feel your own blood was flowing with theirs, like in one beat. You lost yourself, whatever bullshit you had going, and then found yourself again, only bigger. Chico can see Angelina's green eyes now, sparkling in the night like the stars. Funny, but the army didn't seem different at first. Beat the shit out of you until you loved them. They always talk about how they make a man of you, like you're gonna be real macho, real hard, like no feeling. But really it's the opposite, it's all about love. That's how they get you to fight and die. Not because of fear or courage, because of love. Love the country, love the flag, love duty, love your army brothers. But each love gets less real along you slog through a desert so far from home. In the end, only your brothers are real. Makes sense. 
and you stop thinking so much about any of the rest. Angelina isn't sure what he means, but is thrilled by the intimacy of his words. Suddenly he is smiling and reaching over to put his hand on her shoulder. <clears throat> but here I am in another desert and in some other kind of pain, trying to remember what I forgot or maybe what I never knew. And maybe it will feel different tomorrow, but tonight I feel like it will work, like it does make sense, like I know where I, where we are going. In the morning, they awake stiff and cold. They have slept right at the entrance of the cave, a wide hole, wind-worn in the rock that doesn't seem big enough to have sheltered their ancestors, as the stories say from the Spanish, or to house a god. But when they go inside to place the stone from Sheila's cairn on Itoy's rough altar, Chico feels the cool chamber open like the night sky, making its own infinity. Angelina's eyes are moist as she touches the wall of the cave, letting her fingers trail lightly along its surface, like a blind woman reading Braille. There it is, the sea. Angelina is up above Chico. She has managed to crawl out on a rock shelf and leaning hard against the mountain has carefully rounded the cliff to where she can see to the west, a sea of dunes, but beyond of water. The dunes are in fact close, but the water is farther than it seems. The sands, like the water, always play with the pilgrim, each dune coming close, but withdrawing as you go forward. Each crest attained only reveals more on the horizon, always more, and walking on sand proves more difficult than on angry rocks. Ground that yields does not push you forward. From the last high line of dunes, the sand falls gently, sloping to a broad beach. Though the shanks of her legs are stiffened and aching, Angelina runs to the edge of the water, where the white foam surf curls into the gravelly sand. The waves are not high, but the meeting place of sea and earth is very long, stretching beyond sight to the north and south. The sound is strong, a grinding roar that befits a great border. Chico stands for a moment beside her, water, the water, beside her at the water's edge, and then, shedding most of his clothing, takes a running dive through the breaking wave. He strokes quickly out beyond the shallows, where the cooler current caresses and awakens his skin as he dives deep into the clear waters brightened by the sun's rays that reach down to illuminate a world busy with shape and movement and color. Soft purple seaweed undulates over stones encrusted with bright green or red coral and schools of yellow, metallic blue and black fish the size of large coins flicker about as if to music. He opens his hand and watches his mother necklace, mother's necklace drop down through the watery forest, the cross seeming to scatter the tiny fish. And then, submitting to another impulse, he pulls a thin chain over his head and lets it go as well, watching the slower swirl of its lighter metal and the glittering silver flash of the dog tags finding the sea floor. And that's it. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Uh, it, it's so evocative and so full of imagination. Really appreciate uh, your work here. Um, I'd, I'd now like to uh, turn this over to uh, Natalia Mendoza for some comments. And from there, we'll go to Tom and then we'll open it up uh, for a question and answer. You have the floor. Hi. Natalia. Yeah, um, thank you, Jeffrey. And, and thank you, Lawrence, for such a beautiful uh, reading and, and for um, such interesting and funny and beautiful stories that you wrote. I'm just going to keep my comments really short. Um, so the, the first thing that I wanted to say is that I find these uh, collection of stories to be really refreshing at this point. And, and I say so because it seems to me that th there is a kind of um, sensationalist, almost kind of suffering porn that has taken over most of the kind of... Uh, um, mainstream representations on the borderland and that, you know, treats every, everyone as a victim, it treats migrants as victims, it treats indigenous peoples as victims, etc. And I think that your stories really kind of 
you know, convey a sense of sort of complexity and a life that goes on despite the growing militarization of the border. Um, so, and, and I really appreciate the, the humor and, and the kind of the, the humanity in, in, your, in your portrayal of, of, of all these kind of diverse people that meet in this, in this territory. Um, so I think that even though all the stories um, revolve one way or the other around the border, kind of the physical and political reality of the border doesn't kind of um, take over or doesn't monopolize the entire story. That you know, kind of you manage to show that there is all these really complex plots going on um, despite that context. So I think that's uh, at this point is I think very very refreshing. Um, and I kept you, you know sort of I was interested in the question of humor too because it's um, I mean I wanted to hear maybe a little bit more from yourself of how do you. I don't know, how do you sort of balance between, you know, because some of these, you know, some of the scenes that you are describing are actually quite um, terrible or sad or, you know, devastating. And, 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 and how do you sort of combine uh, them with humor? How do you kind of, um, I mean, if this is a conscious process um, and, and, you know, because humor can be very political as well, of course. Um, but then also, I mean, as an anthropologist myself and as an ethnographer of the border, although I work mostly on the Mexican side of the border, I kept thinking, uh, reading your stories, I kept thinking about how, you know, what is it that fiction offers, right? Like that, you know, what are the advantages that fiction offers over traditional ethnographic format? And, and I think that, you know, aside, of course, the aesthetic um, advantages of fiction, right? I think it also, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that even though these, these are fictional accounts, they're actually more accurate in, in many ways than traditional ethnographies, more accurate in that, you know, you don't um, reduce people to their social categories, right? But you actually kind of are able to convey all the nuanced differences between, you know, <laughs> this one Mexican girl here and this, you know, Mexican American girl there and like the, in, rather than packing it, them in one single category, right? So like, you know, even within border patrol officers, right? The differences between like the kind of the individual stance or the, the personality, the, the, the biography um, that actually helps build a much more accurate account of, of, of the territory and its people, right? One that is not, that doesn't essentialize basically, that doesn't essentialize people into their whatever social or cultural category. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, that's what that's really one of the advantages of this, um, you know, kind of a fictional ethnography that that um, that you chose is that it really creates a much more nuanced and um, complex depiction of, of the people and, you know, the individual um, um, differences. Um, so I wanted to, you know, maybe if, if you had some comments about that, I mean, and, and how you, how you, um, kind of created these characters? I mean, to what extent are they based on people you met? Because I mean, they are recognizable too, even though they are very individual, you know, reading the stories, I found myself thinking of, of, of people um, that, that, you know, that would kind of similar to the characters that you were describing. So they are recognizable to a certain extent. Um, so I was thinking, you know, just wanted to hear a little bit more about how you you know, what, what was the process of creating these characters like, you know, to what extent they were based on, 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 on people you met or, or, or to what extent that they representative of, of certain characters one found in, in, in that region. And then I was, you know, I, I really, one of the stories that I liked the most was the endangered species story. Um, I, re I really loved that one. I think it was really profound. It, it made me actually quite nostalgic of, I don't know exactly what, but, uh, but one of the things that I liked a lot about that story is that it kind of shows the overlapping interpretations of the territory that coexist in that you know space around Ajo, right? Like the fact that you have the kind of the you know the the conservation you know ecology sort of people, and then you have the you know of course the autumn people, but then you have also the cattle ranchers, and then you have the 
the, the, the traffickers, and I mean, and they are all basically interpreting this territory in, in, in multiple ways, and those interpretations, you know, occupying the territory, of course, in multiple ways. And then you have the bombing range, etc. Right. So um, it seems that the it, it kind of it really shows how in 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 a, in a place that is often dismissed as kind of no man's land or you know this kind of empty space. Actually, it's actually you know it, it's very complex and it, it's 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 far from being a no man's land. It's actually a place where multiple com, you know, competing in and um, forms of occupying and understanding the territory and the landscape coexist. Um, and I was also kind of struck by your. Uh, I really like how you describe the the cowboys uh, in 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 Aho as being. You said something like you know having a, a sense of themselves that was more based on film than on any other reality kind of they have they have learned to be cowboys based you know watching films basically like watching westerns and um and i like that because i think there is something of that kind of reenactment of the wild west that goes on still in this in this in, in the u.s side right in the in these lands um this kind of um, nostalgic reenactment of of some idea of what the wild west was and I was thinking um, whether, I don't know, I mean, and, and of course, you know, you know, there is, I don't know, I just kind of, with your description of the, of the drug trafficking operation in that same story, um, it made me think of stories that I collected in, in Northern Sonora uh, from the 80s and 90s, which, you know, were stories about smuggling drugs, like, you know, specifically about smuggling weed. And to me, to my generation, those stories also have already this kind of nostalgic aura or of something that it's, it's gone, right? Like drug, drug trafficking doesn't work like that anymore. And those stories are to me are kind of like the, you know, these tales of a, of a world that has vanished in which um, smuggling was all about, um, was all about ingenuity right and kind of like tricks and like you know like and not not so much and based on violence as it is right now but based on your ability to kind of circum you know like circumvent kind of the the um, surveillance etc um and so i was just kind of um wondering whether to you writing these stories did you ever you, you come across a sense of 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 nostalgia or a sense of a world that it's vanishing or that, that you were kind of in a certain way salvaging certain kind of memories of a world that it's that it's now gone or whether you see it in a more kind of long durée um, historical depth and you see it more as a kind of a, as a, as a form of continuity despite you know the obvious militarization of the border on both sides you know through you know both by cartels and, and the um, US law enforcement but you know, to what extent do you see these stories um, as kind of, you know, reminiscent of a world that it's now vanishing, uh, kind of maybe one of my stories. But anyway, we can just um, open this as a conversation and those were some just short comments. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, maybe if we can hold that just for a second and uh, let Tom um, give a brief reflection and then we'll just open it up and then Larry can answer some of those questions as well. Go ahead, Tom. Well, I think uh, Natalia did a beautiful job of commenting on the nuances in these stories. And, you know, I think we're given a very Manichaean uh, interpretation of the border in the mainstream press, you know, sort of good versus e evil. And uh, one of the concepts that in your scholarly writing, Larry, that uh, I really responded to was that of the moral entrepreneur. And that could be everybody from vigilantes who thought they were defending the purity of America to people like No More Deaths or the Good Samaritans who were focused on the well being of the, of the migrants. But both of those views in a sense, essentialize and simplify. And as Natalia pointed out, I think the, the great strength of your stories is it, it complicates that, narr that narrative with really the messiness 
of human beings and human relationships. And uh, my favorite story was Hot Springs. And I, I love the portrait of the young Border Patrol officer, Clark, uh, who, you know, here he is supposedly a representative of, you know, Donald Trump's vision of America closing down the border. And yet what really happens is the border turns out to be far more porous than that view is attempting to, to convince us of. And Clark really becomes absorbed by borderlands culture on both sides of the US-Mexico border and ends up uh, in a sense being co-opted by the humanity of the people that he meets both in the US and on and in, and in uh, Mexico. It reminded me of a wonderful theme in Tommy Lee Jones' movie, The Three Burials of Mel Melchiades Estrada, where the border patrol agent who tries to be such a hard ass gets kidnapped, escapes, get bitten by a rattlesnake, is cured by this young woman he had arrested. Uh, and then as soon as he's cured, she decks him. And then there's this final scene where the three of them are all sitting shucking corn outside this adobe, adobe house. And it's, you know, it's, it's this wonderful portrait of you know, sort of the quotidian daily reality of life on the border that goes on despite the violence, despite the attempts to turn it into this Manichaean battle of good versus evil. And, you know, who's good and who's evil depends on your point of view. So uh, I just thoroughly enjoyed them. And, uh, you know, it spoke, it spoke to me much more of the border and the Mexico that I know and love than uh, a lot of formal accounts of the border, which again, simplify and sort of essentialize what's happening there. So Jeff, I think now we can open it up to Larry and, and, the, uh, and our audience. Thank you, Tom. Um, and I'll just remind everyone, uh, you're welcome to um, submit questions via the tech, the chat box, or uh, you can unmute and just uh, uh, ask them. But first, I'd like to actually give the floor to, to Lawrence just to answer some of those questions and, and and make any comments that you'd like at this moment. Yeah, I'll do that, but I, I, I'll, I'm happy to do it. I won't take much time so because I'm conscious that there are a lot of people out there and I'd love to hear what they have to say. Uh, first, let me make the obvious uh, thanks to, to Natalia and Tom for their uh, generous uh, comments, uh, however undisturbed, uh, undeserved, I'm happy to have them. And uh, uh, that what they say, uh, what they describe is exactly what I was trying to achieve. And I guess this is by way of an answer too to some of Natalia's questions. Um, I think the, the stories arose, and I write a bit about this in the preface to the uh, book, um, from a, a kind of long and sloppy field work where I found myself in all these places over a very long period of time and had the leisurely opportunity to get to know the ver these various worlds uh, to some extent. And so I was, yeah, I was just struck uh, over and over again by the, first of all, the variety, and also by, as Natalia and Tom both put it, the complexity of what was going on. And, uh, and also reacting very much uh, in the way they described, reacting uh, in the sense that this wonderfully human world was not somehow making it out. You did get some very, you know, you, uh, I don't want to over, uh, overstate it. I mean, obviously there's some great literature uh, penetrating particular communities, particularly, I would say, uh, Mexican and Mexican-American communities, but far less on the others and, and 
not much on the interaction of these worlds, uh, which is what really struck me. Um, and partly, I think it was, a, uh, it was also, um, uh, my view was informed by being in Ireland. That is, I was coming back and forth to, not only to this particular area, but from one country to another. And you find yourself, and uh, maybe others of you have this experience as well, if you, uh, especially if you live for years at a time out of your own country of birth, when you go back there, you're struck by things that you took for granted that suddenly you say, wow, that's, you know, that's weird. <laughs> and I found myself over the years being struck over and over again by what seemed peculiarly American as well as uh, border phenomena, like the kind of moral language that seemed so constant and so important, like everybody was always on a mission to define America, uh, uh, whereas in Ireland, pretty people were pretty sure what Ireland was, and you didn't. Uh, there were a lot of arguments, but very little about that. And the same in France, where I had lived for a number of years as well. So it seemed to me that this American project, which is always in process, and which you always have these great moral arguments and divisions, was um, was very interesting. Uh, it, it, and it's odd when you think about it, uh, because politically. If you compare um, the U.S. to Europe, uh, in most European countries, the political left and right are much further apart than the Republican and Democratic parties. Uh, yet, <laughs> the kind, this kind of moral Manichaeism, uh, to use Tom's term there, is much more present here. And that, this is an interesting thing. I'll just throw that out to th for us all to think about, myself included. But anyway, in the process of, of, of doing field work, first just doing field work as an anthropologist, I just kept uh, running into this. And I guess I always had, uh, I was always a, a kind of a person who liked stories, reading them and telling them. Uh, and that was always an appeal to me of anthropology over other kinds of pursuits that you actually got to hang out with, not essentialized, but actual human beings uh, and hear what they had to say. So the stories allowed me, uh, you know, if I took that format, this kind of freedom to tell these stories, but also to talk about what I had seen and thought about as an anthropologist over those years. I also have to give a, a lot of credit to uh, my wife and collaborator there, uh, Maeve uh, Hickey, because when I started working with her, because she's not an academic and would not be interested in having her photographs in academic books, uh, it, it kind of pushed me over, you know, further from that kind of academic language. So it just was very appealing to do it. Um, and uh, I, I was uh, interested in Natalia's response to endangered species. And that was, you know, it's his favorite one of mine as well. But uh, because I got to spend months uh, in over two different years in that setting of um, uh, Aho, but also through I, you know, the generous auspices of the um, wildlife refuge. That's how I got a, a gig there. I got to know them from the inside very well. So I knew all these rangers. I went out into the desert with the Mesid Maeve and uh, got their perspective on things very well. But I had already known uh, many border patrol people and got to know them. And then living in the community over a period of years, I got to know ranchers. And I, in fact, I did one piece of, uh, of cultural, cultural guerrilla activity. I got one of the ranchers who is really the, uh, more or less the Jeff uh, Cameron character in there who is based on somebody that I knew quite well. And I put him in uh, with a ranger and sent them out together <laughs> with me in the back seat. Uh, on a on a jaunt through the whole wildlife refuge, each of them reading it uh, as we went through reading that landscape from their varied perspectives and learning why the other one saw it differently than than uh, than he did. So yeah, and and the the uh, and this is again an answer to Natalia's question about the characters in general. I'm so uh, I'm so happy, of course, to hear that they reminded you of actual people. It's what every writer wants to hear, not, you know, 
how the hell did you make this up? But yeah, they are mostly, in some cases, uh, particularly with some very important characters, they, uh, they are honestly based fairly closely on one or two individuals, and sometimes an amalgamation that I knew uh, very well. And the so um, and the particular uh, and and when I wanted to show a variation, for example, like a border patrol people through through uh, the stories, those were all based on actual uh, uh, different views I'd heard from different border patrols, given their different biographies. I didn't want to make up, you know, someone who was very militaristic versus someone who wasn't. And I got to know over the years the complete spectrum from people, uh, border patrol agents who quit in disgust when they found out what the job really was and didn't see it that way, to ones who had totally military points of view on the whole thing. Uh, and I was very struck by the individual agency in those situations, how much difference it made. Uh, we always talk about the state, you know, and these people being agents of, of the state, which they are. But what you find is uh, when you're out on some border, uh, and some uh, uh, some uh, periphery of the state that these agents of the state have an awful lot of individual leeway in the way they act with with huge consequences uh, one way or another. Uh, and on the humor, I guess because in you know two things I'd say, one thing is that you you know how do you how do you have humor where you have such awful things? Well, generally in life you do in my experience. That's, and maybe that comes from my own background, but it always seemed to me that uh, certain uh, groups of people, and maybe there are many more, but one, of ones I know, uh, their kinds of humor, uh, and the Irish are a good example of this, are, are um, uh, what I call um, preemptive strikes, that is self-deprecating humor uh, of the underdog uh, trying to uh, do a better job on themselves uh, than than the enemy would, <laughs> so you you have a certain kind of sense of irony, especially I would say, of ironic humor, that you run in in certain kinds of situations in the world where people find themselves in a situation where the power is really beyond their control, and their reaction to it is this kind of ironic sense of uh, of themselves and the situation. And I find that, you know, I found that in my own people, I find that in Ireland a lot is a very strong vis-a-vis -vis British domination is very strong theme of that. And then when I wrote about it, and I wrote an article about this in the Irish case, uh, I got letters from people in different parts of the world saying, that's what we're like, <laughs> including Mexicans, by the way, who were, uh, and some people in the Middle East. So. Uh, there, there is that kind of uh, trait going on, I think, uh, that kind of stuff. But I guess in final uh, answer to the question about, you know, writing these stories, I guess I always saw myself uh, as a writer who happened to be an anthropologist uh, rather than an anthropologist who was discovered writing. And so uh, there was, as Tom said, a kind of, you know, an almost natural progression uh, in that direction, uh, from from uh, writing academically to writing short stories like this, so I'll stop there and hope there are. I haven't uh, taken too much time. There's still questions from anybody else. Great, thank you, Lawrence. Yeah, so we'll uh, we can open it up for questions now. So if you uh, want to ask one, please feel free to um, unmute your mic um, or send it to us in the chat box. If I may, uh, Lawrence Taylor, congratulations, number one. Uh, I think you captured not only the complexity, but the nuances of, of this whole transborder region. I mean, you got everything from the powerful to the dispossessed using relajo as their method of defense. <laughs> and you can't capture that level of subtlety unless you've lived it. And so for me, um, capture that quotidian reality of always having to slant one's life in relationship to power, in relationship to subordination, uh, 
but coming out as full human beings in many ways. And even the desperate in your the desperate uh, characters in your work still remain human. They're not archetypes. They're not binary models. And Tom knows this as well as any of us. And I haven't had the pleasure of meeting uh, Natalia uh, Mendoza, but I know your work. But I just wanted to to compliment your the totality of the complexity and the subtleties the region. And yeah, it's changed over time and it becomes, it's become a heck of a lot more corporate in uh, definition, corporate cartels, corporate gun runners, corporate, you name it. And so there is a certain amount of nostalgia in your work, mm. but it's, but it's nostalgia that reveals what's also possible, even in light of the worst kind of oppression. So I thought, look at that. Quería decir muchas gracias. <laughs> yeah, I said, Carlos. I, uh, I'm, of course, I'm very flattered to have Carlos uh, Villasevanas comment on this. If it were, I assume that much of the audience knows his work, and his would be actually. I was thinking, Carlos, of your work when we were talking about the uh, of variation and nuance and so forth, because. Carlos's work is one of the few, I think, on border regions that does get to that range and complexity and humanity of uh, uh, of the place of the people and place. Uh, and I was always uh, guided by it over the years. And, and in terms of the, I'm glad you, 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 in your comment, you reminded me of Natalia's, which I didn't address about, about the nostalgia, uh, because yeah, I think you're, you're both right. And I think, um, first of all, of course, I did the, the work the, out of which this arises began some years ago. And so things have changed even over the years. And, and, and I was even thinking before you said corporate, Carlos, that I would, you know, like with the drug running that Natalia was talking about, it's almost like, it's like a movement from a cottage industry to a, uh, a corporate um, economic enterprise. Uh, you could see the various, you could do an, a whole course in economics from uh, tracing those changes. In fact, it always seems strange to me that people uh, still by and large uh, treat uh, drugs as if it weren't subject to the, you know, the economic processes of every other kind of product, <laughs> but it, it obviously is. And, they, and in, in that change of, of, uh, of who does it and it, the effects on everybody of these changes there is exactly that story to tell, you know, the movement from a, from a cottage industry of uh, individuals in a sense, like, like weavers who have the, you know, we do the weaving in their house, who then get pulled into a factory, except, um, and, and both of those processes end up in, in violence, but violence that's very, you know, obvious and violence that's less obvious. So in the less obvious, uh, movement from cottage industry from through the 18th and 19th century, you have, you know, whole rural worlds blotted out, people losing their land, moving to cities, the rise of all that, uh, with all the impact of that on, on, on everybody who would have been involved. Whereas in the drug trade, of course, you've also going to have this kind of thing. And also with human smuggling, of course, that kind of uh, variation. The difference is uh, in the drug and the human smuggling trade, be, uh, the uh, the violence isn't sort of hidden and slow. It's it's right out there, and and obvious. But yeah, and there's probably an element of my own nostalgia in this, of having <laughs> worked on the border for uh, 25 or more years and seen, even in that time, these kinds of uh, changes uh, more and more. But I'm I'm happy that you. Uh, uh, see even the possibility that's, I, I guess it's the possibility that's always inherent in humanity, you know, if you show that people are men and they don't just, you know, give up and fold in front of things. They, as, as Carlos put it, they so beautifully there, they slant, they find the slant uh, to survive uh, in these worlds and then can suddenly uh, reemerge differently. 
if I could, if I could make a comment on nostalgia about the border, my favorite smuggling story uh, came from a, a student whose uncle, uh, who was a Sonorense, made a small fortune smuggling frozen chickens from the United States down to Hermosillo. And when I first, you know, start when I was really going to Mexico as often as I could, there were far more goods being smuggled from north to south than from south to north. Yeah. Everything from frozen chickens to, uh, you know, everybody's used car. Yeah, I have one more if, if you want me to share it with you about smuggling. Sure. Smuggling, <laughs> smuggling Tio Lencho from Tucson to Magdalena. Tio Lencho uh, uh, died of a natural death. He wanted to be buried in Magdalena, Sonora. So my cousins and I put him in a camper with uh, dry ice around him and put a, a, a book underneath his hands. And we took him across the border stopped by Mexican uh, folks. And uh, he looked up and of course you have little windows on each side of the camper. And Pio Lencho was uh, facing upward with his eyes pleasantly closed, the book underneath his clasped hands and the, uh, the custom uh, guard looked up and he says uh, in Spanish, Oye, que tiene el señor? <laughs> and, and, I said, and, and my cousin Manny said to him, Está dormido porque está muy viejito. <laughs> and the custom uh, guard then said, Pues parece que está muerto. And of course, uh, all of us uh, realized, of course, that uh, we couldn't laugh because we were going to break up because, in fact, he hit the nail on the head. <laughs> then he commented how, how pleasant it was to be old and to be able to sleep uh, for as long as they wished, even in the middle of traffic. So we got back into the camper, went to Magdalena, and, and buried uh, Tio Lencho uh, with style. <laughs> now, you see, if, uh, if I had made that up, nobody would believe it. <laughs> but and, it, and it's also a sign of the uh, similarity of uh, I Ireland and Mexico that I heard a very similar true tale of, uh, of uh, in Ireland uh, from some friends of mine whose who grandfather died in the wrong place and they had him on the uh, uh, propped up in the back of their car <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on a cross country trip. So obviously there is that same slant involved. <laughs> <laughs> in the two places. Without relajo, there is no survival. That's right. <laughs> that is right. Tom knows that as well as any any of us. <laughs> I think we uh, we have time for some more comments and questions. If anybody else, uh, those are kind of tough to beat. <laughs> well, we might be getting uh, near the end of our session here. Oh, that, that's um, fine. Yeah, I think we are, we scared everybody into silence. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I should say that if uh, uh, for everybody out there, if you uh, had uh, if you have a question on your mind and uh, you'd like to communicate it uh, with me, I'd be happy to answer it via email um, because you might not like this kind of uh, form. Too many people staring over your shoulder. But um, my uh, email is easy to uh, remember. It's my name, lawrence.taylor at MU, which is Maynooth University, dot IE, which is Ireland's uh, ending thing. So lawrence.taylor at M uh, MU dot IE. Happy to chat with anybody about this. And, uh, let me just take the opportunity since I'm talking to thank everybody again for so many people for showing up and for the great and uh, generous comments from uh, uh, Tom and Natalia and Carlos. Uh, so I'll say goodbye.
everyone and turn it back to Jeff. That's perfect, Lawrence. Thank you so much uh, for this lovely presentation. Thank you so much for all the great work you've done. Uh, and thank you for all of these years of working on the border and, and telling us about your experience. It's, it's just, I'm so grateful. And I know I speak for all of us here. We're, we're so very grateful for this. So thank you for your time today, Lawrence. And, and thanks to everyone else as well. Bye-bye. We'll Bye-bye.